Pleasure to have George Borjas here today. George is America's greatest expert on the economic analysis of immigration, both legal and illegal. George is now at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Before going to Harvard, as uh, Paul pointed out, George was on the faculty at UCSD here as professor of economics. We're, uh, we're delighted to have him back for a visit. Uh -uh. George's title today is Making It Worse how the U.S. government has tackled the immigration problem wrongly. Please welcome Professor George Borjas to the UCSD Economics Roundtable. Uh, before I start, let me just uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to the Business Roundtable organizers. It's always a pleasure to come back to San Diego. I have very fond memories of the university, of the people here, of the town, so it's always I'm always very happy to come back. And I particularly want to thank Ross, uh, number one, for hiring me in the first place a long time ago, and number two, for inviting me back six months ago, uh, an invitation that I immediately accepted. In any case, uh, what I want to talk about today in this very auspicious moment on immigration policy in U.S. history is really uh, sort of describe the economic impact of immigration and tell you a little bit at the end of, actually a lot at the end, of what it implies for the way that our policy is made up and the way we should be going. But before I start doing that, there's a little anecdote I want to tell you uh, for two reasons. One is it's a true anecdote, which is sort of interesting that it actually happened in real life. And number two is it really highlights what's at, what's at stake here and how we should go out thinking about immigration policy. And the anecdote goes back a few years, back to 1979, January 1979 as a matter of fact, when then Xiaoping, who was then the Vice Premier of China, made his very first state visit to, to the United States. Jimmy Carter had invited him, and then Xiaoping came to Washington. It was big news all over the place. And Jimmy Carter could not wait to get his hands on then Xiaoping in the White House to tell him a few things about human rights in China. So Jimmy Carter came to the meeting very well prepared with a big binder of issues that he was going to raise during the meeting with then Xiaoping. And Issue by issue, the litany went on about human rights in China, and it eventually got down to the issue of emigration from China. In other words, the right of Chinese people to leave the country. As all of you know, communist countries for a very long time prevented their citizens from leaving. So Jimmy Carter said to then Xiaoping, you, know, you have this policy which you basically prohibit Chinese nationals from leaving the country. How could you possibly hope to join the club of civilized nations if you don't allow your people to go? Uh, then Xiaoping smiled sat back for a little bit and thought about it for a few seconds and said, you know, Mr. President, you're absolutely right. So how many Chinese nationals do you want? 10 million? 20 million? 30 million? And that was the end of the discussion about immigration from China during that White House meeting. And the reason that's a really interesting anecdote is because it actually highlights one of the questions that we need to think about whenever we think about immigration policy. There are many, many more people who want to come to the U.S. than we would ever be willing to admit. So any policy we think of realistically has to set a number down. I mean, what is the number that we want to admit? So suppose, for example, that Jimmy Carter had actually thought about this for three seconds prior to the meeting. And he decided, well, maybe 10 million Chinese nationals would not be a bad idea over the next 10 years. So he could have said, you know, Mr. Vice Premier, you know, 10 million over 10 years is not a bad number. But then Deng Xiaoping would have said back, well, Mr. President, which 10 million do you want? We have a billion people to choose from. <laughs> and that is the second question that any immigration policy really has to address. Because there are many more people who want to come to the US, and many more applicants we want to admit. We have got to set up a system that basically discriminates. And I don't mean that in a bad way, just chooses the winners from the losers in this very big uh, pool of applicants that we're going to get. So those two questions, how many and which people, really are at the core of what immigration policy is about. Now, more often than not, you will see the immigration debate sort of diverging into side issues that are really quite unimportant in the scheme of things. Uh, 
But those are the two questions that are, are really at the very core. So what I want to do now is basically show you a little bit of what immigration policy is like in the US. Number two, what do we know about the economic impact of it? And number three, what does it all imply in terms of the direction that we should be going? OK, so th this is basically data from the INS, or the, whatever it's called today, the Bureau of Citizenship and Immigration Services, that goes back as far back as we have data for it. And this graph basically shows you how many legal immigrants we admit to the US over the last almost two centuries. And you can see the ups and downs uh, reaching a low during the 1930s. That low was actually the result of two, of two things. One was, one is a change in policy that I'll talk about in a minute. And the second is the fact that the Great Depression took place. I mean, people didn't want to come to the US when economic conditions were so bad. The earlier peak prior to now happened in the early 1900s. And that's the peak that you basically can refer to whenever you go to, to the movies and see a, you know, a boat under the Statue of Liberty, so the whole mythic image of immigration to the US that your grandparents, great-grandparents had, that's basically that peak. And now we're now basically at another peak in terms of uh, Im the size of immigration to the US. Now, uh, this is a, a slide that would make uh, Bill Gates proud in terms of PowerPoint. I've reduced 1,000-page volumes about immigration policy in the US into a very simple four-line slide, OK? Uh, clearly, this generalizes an awful lot. It ignores a million things. But roughly speaking, this is what immigration policy in the US has been like for the last, you know, since the country's been a country. Before 1875, there were no restrictions on immigration in the US. If somehow you could get your body into the US mainland, you were considered a legal immigrant, and you get a green card, to use the phraseology today. Beginning in 1875 through the early 1920s, Congress began to impose an ever longer series of exclusions on which people could qualify for entry into the US. By 1924, the exclusions included all Asians, convicts, people who had public charges, uh, and a whole bunch of other people with health problems, and so on and on and on and on. As a result of the great migration of the turn of the, 19th, at the beginning of the 20th century that I referred to earlier, <laughs> Congress reacted. And the reaction uh, basically led to, in 1924 to what we now call the National Origins Quota System. In 1924, Congress for the first time sat down and actually answered the two questions that I posed at the beginning of my talk. How many people to admit and which people to admit. So Congress for the first time put a numerical limit on legal immigration to the US. And not only that, it said since many more people want to come to the US than the numerical limit is, we're going to allocate visas according to national origin. And the national origin they picked was a national origin mix of the US population at the time. In other words, they wanted an ethnic mix that more or less replicated what was already here. As a result of that, two countries, the UK and Germany, got two thirds of the visas. All other countries got very few visas, and some countries, Asia, for example, got no, some, some continents, Asia, for example, got no visas whatsoever. That system was in line until about 1965. In 1965, as a result, perhaps, of the whole civil rights movement, Congress re-looked, began to take a, a re-look at the, at the national origins quota system, saying it was discriminatory, which it obviously is. But don't forget any, any immigration policy that will admit fewer people than we have, than we, than are willing to come, has to discriminate on some fashion. Except this particular policy discriminated along national, along national origin lines. So what Congress did at that time was to recast the whole system in terms of what is called family preferences. So right now, the way the system works, and by the way, in 1965, Congress also increased slightly the, the numerical limit of legal immigration into the US. But right now, the way the system works is that family preferences, as opposed to national origin, as opposed to any kind of economic potential, is really the way uh, along which most people can get into the country. And just to give you an idea of what I mean by that, this is the way the system has worked for the last 40 years. Again, the key word here is legal immigration. In the last, the last four years for, we have, for which we have data, 2001 through 2004, we basically admitted 4 million people, a million a year legally. And of those 4 million people, about 2 thirds happen to be family preference type visas. Now, there's two kinds of family preference visas. One is immediate relatives, for example, your spouse or a parent,
or, or, a, or a minor child, those come in immediately and they come in above the quota. They're not counted against the numerical limits that are imposed by Congress. And then the other kind of family preference would be something like siblings. Once the person becomes a citizen, a new entitlement opens, opens up. You can now sponsor the entry of your siblings. But think of what that means in the long run. Once you can sponsor the entry of your siblings, your sibling spouse can enter the country, which means your sibling spouse's parents can enter the country, which means your sibling spouse's parents' siblings can enter the country, which means on and on and on, and uh, that's, uh, that's our current system. Somebody actually, as a joke, calculated by the year 2200, everybody in the world will qualify for entry <laughs> if this system were led to go forward you know, without any kind, of any kind of limits. In any case, that, that basically is the, the bulk of, immig of legal immigration to the US today. Employment-based immigration is actually not that big. And by employment-based, actually misnomer, because that includes the people who qualify for the employment-based visa, as well as their families. So the spouse and children are included in that number. Refugees, asylees, another small number. And last but not least, something that's sort of called diversity visas. A very funny name for what's really just a lottery, OK? And the lottery actually is a very good example that illustrates the demand for entering to the US. Literally speaking, the US raffles something on the order of 40,000 visas per year. In other words, you can actually get on the INS website in October or November when the open enrollment period occurs and fill out the form if you are abroad, and 40,000 visas are raffled out. In the last lottery before 9-11, for 40,000 slots, 11 million people applied. Now that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the demand for entry to the US. And it gives you an idea of why it is that numerical limits of some kind have to be imposed. And it also gives you an idea of why we have to choose among the many people who want to come to the country as to how to locate the visas. Now on top of all this, we have illegal immigration. And illegal immigration, the number fluctuates daily these days, ever going up. Uh, there are at least 10 million illegal immigrants in the US. That number, the last time I looked, was increasing at the rate of half a million people a year. But it might actually be going even faster than that. I've seen some numbers in the last couple of months that it may be going up at the rate of 700,000 people a year. The bulk of those people originate in Mexico, but not all. And a third live in California. Now, if you add the million legal immigrants we get and the half million or so illegal immigrants that we have, we're basically increasing uh, Immigration is increasing the number, the, the, the size of the population by a million and a half, almost two million people every year now. So it's really an, a, a historical peak that really has very little comparison in the past. Now let me talk, let me turn to economics. Uh, the, one of the crucial impacts of immigration is in the workforce, in the labor market. A big debate over uh, in the last couple of months has been as to what immigrants do in the labor market, to opportunities, to profits, to consumer prices, and so on and so forth. This is what it looks like in terms of the representation of immigrants in the workforce. As you can, basically, the, 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 what I'm graphing here is what fraction of workers in the US are foreign born. You can more or less see that up until 1970, the number was pretty tiny, and in fact was declining slightly. And then beginning in 1970, the result of the change in policy in 65, the number began to increase very rapidly. So right now, almost 15% of the workforce is foreign born, which is almost a tripling of what it was 30 years ago. Really a remarkable rise in a very short time period. But that graph actually masks what is really going on in the US. This is a more instructive graph. Immigration is very localized. Same thing, what fraction of the workforce is foreign born? California, as you can see, is a way out there outlier. California 30 years ago, 40 years ago, was not a particularly heavy immigrant recipient state. But right now, California has gone from being 10% immigrant in, in the terms of workers to uh, over, slightly over a third immigrants in a very short time period. The other immigrant states, which are the other five immigrant states where most immigrants tend to locate themselves, have also gone up in terms of how many immigrants reside there, but nothing like California. And then the rest of the country, the 44 other states in the rest of the country, in fact, have, re have really seen very little immigration until recently. That began to change in the 1990s. As you can see in that graph, there's a little steepening of, of the immigrant share in the, in the rest of the country beginning in the 1990s, 
So it's really only very recently that immigration began to sort of filter out from California and the other immigrant states into the, other, into, into the bulk of the, of the United States. Now, why, uh, wh wh what does the economic impact of immigration depend on? I want to talk about two things, very briefly. One is, uh, what happens to the labor market? What happens to the, the earnings of natives when immigrants enter the country? This graph tells you why we're having a debate over this today. This graph, and again, as all of you know from reading the paper over the last two months, there's a big contentious debate in economics over what the impact is and so on and so forth, right? This graph uses no fancy statistics of any kind, econometrics, just, just raw data. And it basically asks the question, what is the wage differential between immigrants and natives at any point in time over the last 40 years? And this is for men, by the way, between immigrants and, 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 and native men over the last 40 years. If you go back in the graph, basically what the line tells you is that if you go back to 1960, the typical immigrant, immigrant man in the U.S. was earning at that time about 7 or 8 percent more than the typical native man. In other words, immigrants on average were more productive, they, they, they were more skilled, they, earned, they had higher earnings. The key result here is sort of the downward sloping trend of this thing. Uh, by, night, by the year 2000, immigrants on average are earning about 20% less than, than native men. It is that trend that is really at the heart of why we're having a debate over this today. Because the, the low, the, the decline in skill level of immigrants as compared to natives is behind, it's really what determines the economic impact of immigration in the U.S. And there are two questions I want to address. One is, what is the impact of, of unemployment opportunities of natives? What happened to native wages, for example, when immigrants come in? I often find it useful when you look at such a, a contentious question to sort of step back and ask, what would people have said outside this context? So I actually went back to Paul Samuelson's textbook, a very famous textbook in, econo in economics, to the 1964 edition, which is one year prior to the policy shift. And looked in the index and said, what does Samuelson think about immigration in the US? At the time, there was very little immigration, as all of you know, know from the previous slide. And what Samuelson says is sort of very, very telling. He, says, he basically said, look, since World War II, we restricted immigration. That restriction in supply, you would expect to increase wages. And what we're discussing right now is sort of the mirror image of that. We've relaxed that restriction. We've increased immigration a lot. So the pure, simple law of supply and demand would tend to suggest that as the supply increased, wages would fall. Now, that's a very contentious question. Con question. There's been a big debate in economics about how to measure that in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, it's still somewhat unsettled, but let me tell you very briefly what the debate is about. A lot of the literature happened to try to answer this question empirically by basically doing the following kind of comparison. They would say, look at a city like San Diego, where there are many immigrants. A city like San Diego, you would expect, if, sort of Samuelson, if the supply and demand theory is correct, you would expect the wage of natives to be lower than in a city like Pittsburgh, where there are very few immigrants. So a lot of the literature sort of compares these cities and tries to determine whether, in fact, natives in San Diego holding everything else equal are a little, a little worse off than natives in Pittsburgh. When you do that kind of comparison, you don't find very much. And there's a big debate over why you don't find very much. I personally think it's for two reasons. One is immigrants are not stupid. They happen to try to locate themselves in cities that have high wages. They want to locate themselves in cities that have growing economies. That will tend to create a positive, a spurious correlation that may tend to swamp whatever the law of supply and demand would tell you. But on top of that, the fact is that natives respond. Natives are not stupid. If wages really fall in San Diego, you might easily expect to find a native outflow of workers out of San Diego. And that outflow will diffuse the impact of immigration from here to other cities in the US. So that, that intercity comparison cannot be, may not be very sensible. As a result of that, of that argument, what I did a few years ago was to develop a methodology that tried to look at the impact of immigration at the national level. In other words, let's look at the labor market, say, for high school dropout for 40 years old. Do we know what happened in the labor market the last 40 years? Did the wage for those workers of that skill group respond to the entry of immigrants in the last 40 years? And you do that for every skill group. In fact, they did it for, by, by education and by, and by age, basically. And when you do the national analysis, it is very clear that there's a very strong negative correlation between wages and immigration. 
The latest results come from a paper that's been pretty widely cited in the newspaper for the last couple of months by myself and my colleague at Harvard, Larry Katz. And what we did was actually to sort of estimate what we call the short run impact of immigration based on 40 years worth of data. In other words, the historical series of, of the wage data since 1960 until now. And the short run is basically the immediate impact, holding everything else equal. What happens when immigrants come into the country? The long run is basically, as immigrants come into the country, people adjust and capital adjusts. In other words, firms expand. And what happens after all the expansion takes place? In other words, suppose that after everything is said and done, all the adjustments that could take place in fact take place. So the way to see these two columns is really to say the impact is somewhere in between those two numbers. Overall, in the short run, immigration will lower wages by about 3%. In the long run, it will have no impact on wages because capital will adjust completely in the kind of model that we have. Okay? Now, the real impact here is among high school dropouts. A lot of the immigrants in the United States, particularly those originating in Mexico or, or, South or Central America, are high school dropouts. That is where the supply shift has been the greatest. And for that group, you see the lowering of the wage somewhere between 5 and 8%, depending on the time horizon that you have. So it is, you know, now you might say, well, that's not a very big number, and that's probably true. But what I'll tell you on the other hand is the following. The average salary of a high school dropout in the U.S. is around 25000 a year. So we're talking of a pay, uh, a, pay, a pay reduction due to immigration of at least $1,000 a year, even in the long run, if that ever were attained. So the fact is, there's an impact, and it's an impact that hurts low-skilled workers the most. Now, that is not to say that everybody loses, because some people clearly gain. Otherwise, we'd have no immigration in the US at all. So some people are gaining. If you take this model that I just described to you and sort of manipulate it a little more and work the whole thing out, you can actually calculate who gains and who loses as a result of all this. And the, the, basically, the losers in the, due to immigration are native workers who are competing with immigrants. These numbers, are, by, by the way, are short-run numbers. In other words, what happens in the short run as a result of immigration holding everything else equal? The reduction in the wage, when you add it up across all workers, is not a trivial number in the US today. It may well be in the order of almost you know, $280 billion. That is not all that happens, though. Firms gain, at least in the short run. And those gains actually exceed what workers lose. That creates what we call an immigration surplus. Just like trade, immigration expands the economy. But the expansion is actually very slight. It's only about $20 billion a year. What immigration is really about is redistribution of, of, of wealth from people who compete with immigrants to people who use immigrants. Now, over time, a lot of that, of, the, of, that, of, of, of that gain will be going down to consumers. But you can still basically phrase it as something along the following lines. Immigration basically hurts people who compete with immigrants and people who use immigrants, whether they be employers or consumers or upper middle class Californians who have a gardener and a maid and so on, those are the people who gain from immigration. So it's really a distribution of wealth at heart. When you think of it that way, you understand the political dynamics of this much better. We're not fighting over, over an increasing pie in a, in a real sense. We're fighting over a different split of the pie. Now, that's one issue in economics of immigration that's received a lot of attention. The other one is the welfare issue regarding immigration. And what I have here, again, I'm ignoring a million things that happen in between, but just the key, some key dates as to how Americans have responded to the possibility that immigrants use welfare over uh, US history. The very first restrictions on immigration in the United States, actually in the US territory, okay, happened in the very enlightened and very liberal states of Massachusetts back in the early, you know, 1645 or so, when they actually outlawed the entry of people who could become a public charge. New York State, another very liberal, very uh, right-thinking kind of place, in 1691 set up a bonding system. If you wanted to sponsor the entry of a poor immigrant into the state, you had to put up a bond to the state. And only then would that poor immigrant be allowed. Uh, over time, Congress began to get involved. In 1882, Congress passed a law that's been in the books for over a century, prohibiting the entry of people who could become a public charge in the US. So it's been in the books for a century. Beginning in 1903, again over a century ago, Congress passed a law 
mandating that people who become a public charge in the U.S. be deported. Now, needless to say, none of those two things has really been enforced in the last few decades, but they are part of U.S. law, U.S. immigration law. And then in 1996, Congress moved in again by passing welfare reform. As many of you might know, one of the key provisions in the 96 legislation that Clinton signed was to prohibit new immigrants, or non-citizens to be more precise, from receiving assistance. And the law passed, and there was an initial reaction that maybe uh, it was working. This is what's actually happened over time in the last 10 years to the fraction of households that receive assistance in the US. A uh, couple of things are worth noticing about this graph. First of all, there's a big gap between the fraction of immigrants who receive assistance and the fraction of natives who receive assistance. You can see that by, by in the most recent data that we have, almost a quarter of immigrant households receive something. And by something, it's sort of in the title, it's either cash, food stamps, or Medicaid, as opposed to only about 15% of native households. The second thing that's noticeable here is the fact that there was, a, there was in fact a pretty big decline, particularly for immigrants, around 1996 as a result of welfare reform. But you can basically see that over time, that decline was neutralized. And we're now back where we began. So welfare reform, in terms of immigration at least, was a complete failure. And you might ask yourself why. And there is two interesting reasons for that. And, and one is behavioral, one is political. The behavioral reason is that as the, as Clint, as the legislation now reads, it is non-citizens that are not qualified for assistance. Well, there's a very simple cure for that. Become a citizen. And there was a huge increase in naturalization rates in the late 1990s, for allowing immigrants to, be, to, be qual to qualify for assistance, number one. Number two, Congress, as part of the legislation, also gave states the right to, uh, to put in state money and replace whatever federal monies had gone away from the system to, for, for immigrant assistance. And some states went in and, and replaced all the money and actually put in some more. California in particular was extremely responsive to this. It was extremely generous to the federal cutbacks, basically putting in all, all new state money to provide assistance to, to the immigrants. So the political dynamics of the immigration were such that in some states, particularly in the large immigrant states, the state government responded by literally putting state money in to fund whatever federal programs have been, cu have been cut back. And that too explains the pattern. Only one immigrant state did not do that, did not replace the federal money. And that immigrant state, by the way, is Texas. Uh, anyway, let me move on and uh, tell you something about the bottom line of all this. Do immigrants pay their way in terms of welfare and assistance? The best study on this was done by the National Academy about uh, 10 years ago. And they, what they did was to look at two states, one of them being California. And they went line item by line item in the California budget, trying to calculate how much taxes immigrants paid and how much of each program in the California budget had an, a cost increase due to immigration. And the number they came up with was that immigration in California imposed uh, a net drain on the native, on the typical native household in California of about $1,200 a year, which is not a trivial amount. So clearly in some localities, now California in particular is very strongly affected by this for two reasons, by the way. One is California has a lot of low skilled immigrants so that assistance is required for a lot of these people. And number two, California is very generous. So when you actually move to other states, the other state that the National Academy looked at was New Jersey, you tend to find nothing of the kind in most other states. That number is very California specific. Nationwide, the number is only about, it's cut out there, but nationwide, the number is only around $200 a year. So the fact of the matter is, there's really strong evidence, number one, that immigrants on net create probably a slight substantial burden, a slight burden on the typical native household in the US. How much nationwide that would be if you add it up in terms of dollars, it would not be very much. It'd probably be in the order of maybe 10 billion, 20 billion dollars a year. Okay, not much more than that. So really, it's, it's money, but in the scheme of things, it's basically change. At the same time, there's also evidence that immigrants through the labor market productivity gains that they create create a small gain to the economy of about $20 billion a year. You know, after looking at this for many years, I've sort of concluded that it would not be far-fetched for somebody to look at the data objectively 
and say on net is probably a wash. Okay, it doesn't really matter all that much on net in terms of what the net impact of immigration is on the US economy. But that is really masking a lot of what's going on. Because at the same time that on net the gain is basically trivial, the loss is basically trivial, there are, base, there are important redistributions going on. So there are people who gain, and the people who gain, gain a lot, and there are people who lose. And these two numbers more or less sort of outweigh each other in the scheme of things in the US. And that would not be a, a, that would not be a very wrong way I mean, let me actually rephrase that. That would not be an implausible way to think of what immigration does to the US today. Nothing much on net, but redistribution at the, uh, in, in terms of where the gains and loss are distributed. Now, let me conclude by basically turning to uh, policy issues from all this. I've spent 20 minutes describing what the economics tells you about all this. You know, the impact on, labor, on the labor market, the impact on welfare, and so on and so forth. It is now worth asking the following question. What does this all imply for policy? I have a two-word two, two answer to that. And the two-word answer is absolutely nothing. OK? I mean, and that's, that's the fact of life. None of these facts have any policy implications unless you put in some kind of value system by which to judge those facts. It's a very simple matter. Let me give you, what, let me give you an example of what I mean. Suppose, for example, that your value system, your objective was to save taxpayers money. Well, the admission of low-skilled immigrants is not really a very, a, very, uh, a very good way of accomplishing that objective. So the fact that, for ex the fact that we've seen that immigrants tend to receive welfare a lot com as compared to natives is not a good outcome. And you want to change the law to change it in a particular way, to get rid of that. But suppose, on the other hand, that your objective was to help poor people from all over the world. Well, the fact that you have an immigrant using welfare quite a bit is a great outcome. That's what you want to do. You want to bring them in and help them out. So the facts by themselves really have no policy implications. And that's something that people tend to ignore whenever they debate immigration or many, many other things. In order to put context to the debate, you have to take all these facts and superimpose on top of all that what the objective function should be, what the national interest should be. And that is something about which we, I mean, these facts in theory, at least, you know, after many, after many years of research, could all be settled one way or the other. What the objective function should be is something we'll never settle. Because my objective function is mine alone and, you know, may not be shared by anybody in this room. So there, there, there's always going to be a disagreement, really, over how to interpret these facts and superimpose in, uh, wh what the immigration policy should be from the facts alone. And unfortunately, when we debate immigration in the US, we debate, over, we debate over the facts. In other words, do immigrants use welfare or not? Do immigrants lower wages or not? That's really the wrong kind of debate to have. The right kind of debate to have is, what should immigration do for the US? What, kind of, what, kind of, what, what is it that we want immigration to accomplish for us? Until we answer that question, none of this really means very much. Now having said that, let me go ahead and superimpose my objective function, which happened, I'm actually, let me rephrase that. Let me superimpose an objective function that would not be unreasonable for an economist to hold. And that objective function is, suppose we wanted immigration to increase you know, economic well-being of the people already here. In other words, clearly, there, there are many more things that matter in the world. The immigrants matter. The people left behind matter. But suppose we just restricted ourselves to an objective function. So what should we do if all we cared about was improving the economic well-being of people already here? Now, notice how carefully I'm phrasing people already here. I don't call them natives. I don't call them immigrants. I just say people already here. And what should we do in the future to improve the economic well-being of people already here? Well, I think one can argue that having, uh, uh, the, having the kind of system we have where there are no filters for skill is probably not a good, uh, not a good way of accomplishing that, of improving the economic well-being of people already here. One of the things that economics will teach you is that we have a lot more to gain by letting in skilled workers than by letting in low-skilled workers. And uh, the gains are actually quite substantial in terms of economic efficiency. The, the, that $20 billion gain I told you before on net for the, from the productivity gains could be much, much higher if, imi if immigrants were more skilled. And on top of that, the distributional impact will be much, much, much better than what we have now. Right now, immigration is widening income inequality. A shift to a more skilled system would actually narrow income inequality. 
Now you might say, how do we accomplish that? Well, we accomplish that by looking at other countries. If you want to see the way a skilled immigration system works, all you have to do is when you leave the room today and get back to your office, Google uh, Canada Immigration. That will get you to the Canadian Immigration website, and there will be a test there for you to take, literally a test. They will ask you questions. Each answer will be graded. At the end of the test, the points will be added on, and they will tell you over the web whether you qualify for entry or not. They will ask you things like, how old are you? If you say over 45, you know, they'll probably say, go to the US instead. <laughs> uh, they will ask you things like, how much schooling do you have? If you say high school dropout, they say, you know, there's another country down there you might want to go to. Uh, they will ask you, what do you do for a living? I would say economist, and they have an 11-page occupational table. For each occupation, they have points attached to that. You look up economist, one point out of 15. Okay? <laughs> so at the end of all this, you add up the points. I fail. I mean, I, I fail every time I take the test. There's nothing I can do to get in. But the fact of the matter is there's been a lot, of, a lot of thinking going on in Canada as to how it is they want their immigrant population to, to be and, and what kind of economic impact they want. A remarkable thing about Canada also is the following. When they add up all the points, they will say something like this. And by the way, this month, the passing grade is X. The passing grade has actually changed over time, responding to Canadian economic, economic conditions. When the unemployment rate in Canada is high, the passing grade goes up. When the unemployment rate is low, the passing grade goes down. That's a very rational way of thinking about immigration if what you care about was economic impact. Now, in the US, the US will never, ever admit officially that we have this kind of system. It's called a point system. I mean, we in, officially, we don't have a point system. But in fact, we do. Because every immigration policy, going back to the beginning of my talk, must answer the questions, who to get in, how many to let in, which is the passing grade, and which of the many. In other words, the, which weights to attach to the variables. In the US, we have one question in the test for most people. And the question is, do you have family? If the answer is yes, you get 100 points. If the answer is no, you get zero points. And that's the end of the, the, end of the test. So we all have the same kind of model. It's just that in Canada, it's a little more detailed and more economically oriented than the US. Now, to do that would require shifting away from the family preference system towards a skill preference system, which I know from talking to people in Washington has about zero chance of being, you know, going into, into play in the US anytime soon. Now, the second thing that we're debating these days is illegal immigration. Illegal immigration, uh, you know, clearly if you, what you care about is economic impact in terms of having more skilled workers, letting in 12 million people over the last 20 years who have never been screened for their economic potential clearly cannot be a good idea in the scheme of things. So something should be done about it. Now, what Congress is trying to do now is uh, basically two things. One is an amnesty, and one is a guest worker program. Uh, since somebody will ask me later, let me just answer right now what I think about both of these things. Uh, I think uh, they're both terrible mistakes. And uh, let me tell you why. The amnesty terrible mistake is actually the second amnesty, actually the second big amnesty we will give in the last you know, 20 years. The first big amnesty occurred in 1986. We granted amnesty to three million people under the presumption that there would be, uh, you know, that that would solve the problem of illegal immigration at that point. Uh, at the time, three million people sounded like a big number of illegal immigrants. We're not talking about four times that number. So the fact of the matter is, there may well be a good case to make that any kind of amnesty just encourages more illegal immigration if the numbers become big enough. So the way I view the world in terms of this, of this discussion right now is to say, look, there is we clearly are not going to deport 12 million people. I mean, that's not going to happen. But on the other hand, there are things we can do to actually sort of uh, minimize the problem in the long run. One of the things we can do, and I think it's a, the correct way to proceed, is to say, look, we don't want to really think about what will happen to the 12 million people who are already here illegally until we make sure that we don't have to revisit the issue 10 years from now. In other words, we're going to eventually have to face up to the fact of somehow legalizing 12 million illegal immigrants but let's not think about that until we know that it's 12 million and no more. So I would much more prefer to go to a system where we actually do enforce uh, much stricter border controls and actually do enforce employer sanctions. Because the, right now, the system of employer sanctions is basically a joke. We you know employers aren't really paying any kind of penalty for any of the costs that are imposed on the US by illegal immigration. They get all the benefits, and uh, they bear few of the costs. So 
employer sanctions, border control, contr and once you actually establish that illegal immigration has been reduced to a manageable amount, then you can revisit the issue of what to do with people already here. And by that time, believe me, most of the people already here would have either married or procreated, and they will have some claim on the legal preference, on the legal family preference system. I mean, many of them already do. So the fact of the matter is that five, ten years from now, we really don't have to do very much to legalize those people because they already happen to have legal claims on the system. So just slowing it down and taking a two-step approach would be a much better way of looking at the problem than doing this one big thing that they're trying to do right now. Now, in terms of guest workers, uh, my problem with that is that it's a very dishonest way of increasing immigration. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with saying, let's change our policy so that instead of letting in a million legal immigrants a year, we let in 1.5 million legal immigrants a year. That's a good debate to have, and it's worth having that debate. The problem with guest workers is they're hiding that change in policy under the presumption or under the facade that somehow people are coming here temporarily. And as many people who study this actually say, there's nothing more permanent than a guest worker. I mean, the fact of the matter is most of those people will come. You know, again, the family preference system sort of ensures, you know, people come, they date, they get married, they have children. They almost ensure some kind of legal claim for many of these people in the end. So there's nothing wrong in theory with saying let's increase the number of employment-based visas. Let's just do it in another sort of way as opposed to hiding behind a facade that is a very temporary thing. It's not a temporary thing. Okay, uh, but one more thing I forgot to mention regarding amnesty. It's a little fact that I have there. There's really a very, a very serious fairness issue when you talk about amnesty for illegal immigrants. Right now, people have been on queue since 1983 from the Philippines to enter the country legally. So, you know, just think about, about what, what, what's the meaning of having a legal immigration policy when, uh, that restricts people entry for, 20, for, almost, for 23 years when you're basically willing to grant amnesty to people who came yesterday or two years ago or five years ago based on the fact that it's a politically powerful uh, group. Uh, okay, last but not least, something I haven't talked at all, national security. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about this issue for the last 20 years, and uh, I'm sort of convinced that economics alone and any argument I've made today will never really have an impact anywhere in the world, okay? Uh, what's really gonna change immigration policy from the way it is now to something else will not be the economic arguments, will not be whether immigrants use welfare or not, will not be whether immigrants lower wages or not. The only thing that can break the current, the current equilibrium we're at and move it to an equilibrium is some kind of catastrophic national security related uh, disaster, basically. When that happens, that is when we will rethink immigration policy and that is when I'll be able to go to my early slide and add a fifth line about a major shift in policy. Until then, things will go the way they are simply because economic interests are hard. Wanted to keep going the way they are. People who gain, gain a lot from having the system the way it is right now. And that's a very important thing to remember. There's no, in, there's no incentive in the system right now to change it from what it is. Now, let me conclude by, uh, uh, by basically saying the following. I think it's an important lesson from economics. I, I gave a, little, uh, a quote from Samuelson before. Let me now quote Milton Friedman. There is no free lunch. And this is a very important thing to remember. A lot of people who are very pro-immigration uh, think that there are only benefits associated with immigration. People who are very anti-immigration think there are only costs associated with immigration. In fact, there are benefits and costs. You know, there are good things that come from it, and there are not so good things that come from it. You know, we had breakfast here today. There were some things there that were produced by immigrants in the California fields, and uh, you know, some of those things are probably cheaper because of that. So some of us have benefited substantially. I'm in Southern California right now. The fact of the matter is, that when I lived here, many upper middle class Southern California households benefited immensely from having legal immigration and from having low skill Mexican immigration. You know, they were able to take care of their yard, they were able to take care of their children by hiring live-in, full-time nannies, and so on and so forth, right? So there clearly are benefits. But let's not forget that each of those benefits really imposes a cost. There's no, there's no free lunch, there's no free breakfast. You wanna think of it that way. Those benefits impose a cost. Somebody is paying for the labor market impact of that. Somebody is paying for the social cost of that in terms of increased public assistance monies, the, 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 the health system, the schooling system, and so on. 
So I think having a more balanced view of what immigration does is actually one of the key lessons from economics. There are people who benefit and there are people who lose, just like with any other social policy. Uh, with that, let me conclude and, and take questions. A couple of UCSD professors, uh, uh, Professor Julian Betts of the UCSD Economics Department and Professor Gordon Hansen of UCSD's Economics Faculty and uh, School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. Julian, you kick it off. Uh, George, I'd just like to say welcome back. Thank you. Um, your, your story about the Canadian skills test is very intriguing to me personally as a U.S. citizen born in Canada. You said an economist gets one point out of 15 on the Canadian skills test. If you're 45 or over, well, I'm an economist and I'm exactly 45, and I think you just told me I can't get back into my name. <laughs> um, my, my question for you is uh, the, the social policy issues is, is fabulous. Um, there are other policies which also should affect the incentives to migrate to the United States. Um, the one I want to talk about is North American Free Trade Agreement. A lot of people, when the U.S. passed NAFTA, felt that one of the motivations of the U.S. government was to boost economic development in Mexico and reduce the incentive to, to come to, to the U.S. And the theory is simple. We lower tariffs for goods from Mexico. That spurs investment in Mexico, job growth, increases wages of Mexicans, incentives to, to migrate legally or illegally to the United States go down. Uh, since the passage of NAFTA, what do we actually know about what has happened to the Mexican economy? And is there any evidence at all that NAFTA has, has had an effect on immigration? It's a great question. One to which Gordon Hansen actually knows a lot more than I do about this. So maybe he can answer better than I. But the data I've seen, actually, is that per capita, and it's not Gordon's data, as a matter of fact, is that the ratio of per capita income in Mexico to the U.S. has not increased over the last 10 years, more or less. I mean, there's been a downward trend, and uh, it's, it's a little lower now than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So uh, it doesn't seem as if NAFTA has actually uh, improved economic well-being in Mexico sufficiently to have a, an impact on, on the migration flow from Mexico to the U.S. Uh, okay. Yeah, he, he knows more about it than I know. Uh, George, great, uh, great presentation. Um, and thinking about your uh, the, the policies regarding uh, illegal immigration, right now we're spending about $15 billion uh, in enforcing the uh, U.S. borders against illegal immigration. As you mentioned, it's not been terribly effective. We're letting in 500,000 or more people uh, on net each year. Since immigration seems to be more or less a wash at a national level, wouldn't raising enforcement to a level that would actually prevent illegal inflows uh, and the cost we incur in doing so actually ensure that our new policy would yield a net loss for the U.S. Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, we don't really know how much it would cost to enforce uh, to enforce stricter border controls in terms of slowing down illegal immigration, the li limit Im illegal immigrant population or flowing to the U.S. I suspect that a much more effective way of controlling legal immigration in the U.S. is by putting more resources on employer sanctions. In other words, as opposed to sort of controlling the border mile by mile, it may well be easier to cut the demand, to, to basically um, reduce the demand for, skill, for, for, for low skill illegal immigration by making employers who do that pay the penalties themselves. And that would not incur the huge cost of increasing border enforcement. Uh, it would require some kind of method to identify people who are legal versus being illegal in the U.S. But I'm not really sure that it would, it would incur such a big cost that would make it a net loss for the U.S. at that point. Now don't forget that uh, if you were to cut down illegal immigration substantially, it's certainly true that some gains will go down, right, in terms of the, the productivity gains associated, associated with legal immigrants. But it may well be that the cost that they impose on the system in terms of social assistance, health benefits, and so on, are much, more, much greater than the gains they actually provide to the economy. I've never seen an estimate of, of the net gains associated with illegal immigration per se. So I'm not really convinced that even though on net for all immigration in the U.S., which is what I was talking about, on net is a wash, for illegal immigrants it's also a wash. It may well be a, net, a, a slight loss. I'm not really sure. 
of the costs or the benefits uh, associated with the children or grandchildren of illegal immigrants? And if so, what are the results of those studies? Uh, uh, I'm sure there have been a few studies looking at the children of illegal immigrants. I'm not familiar with them very, very well. Most of the studies that I know of uh, tend to look at the children of immigrants. The reason being that it's very hard to pinpoint in data whether a person who's a second generation person, in other words, both parents were born, or at least one parent was born abroad, it's very hard to tell in the data whether that person's parents enter legally or not. So well, all we know is that the parents were immigrants, were foreign born, and then we can look at the second generation. What the data seem to suggest by looking at past history is that the gaps that exist between the second generation and the native population tend to narrow substantially in one generation. They don't completely close down, but they narrow. As well as the gaps that exist between, say, Mexican immigrants and Canadian immigrants in the first generation, which are huge, also tend to narrow. Uh, sort of a factoid of all this that comes out of the analysis is that if you think of the, of the wage gap between any two groups as being an indicator of their relative skills, that more or less goes down by half per generation. So in the first generation, whatever gap we see today will go down by half, and the next generation, with the, the half of what remains will go away also. Uh, now, whether that's fast or slow, it's really up to the, to the observer, but I can tell you the following we want to sort of predict into the future. Right now, the typical Mexican immigrant in the U.S. earns about 75% less than the typical Canadian immigrant in the U.S. That's just a fact. It's a, the, a huge wage gap between Mexican immigrants and Canadian immigrants. Now, a lot of these Mexican immigrants are illegal. I don't know how, what fraction, but it would be a, a, a substantial number. Go forward in time 30, 40 years and say, what does past history tell you about the relative economic standing of those two groups? Past history would tell you that that number will go down by half. If, the, if past history held again in the next century, that gap will be halved, which basically says that in the year 2040, the children of Mexican immigrants would earn about 37% less than the children of Canadian immigrants. Again, project further into the future, 2080. Again, if past history is a guide, that gap will be the, go, go down by half. So in the year 2080, the, ch the grandchildren of today's Mexican immigrants would earn about 18% less than the grandchildren of today's Canadian immigrants. In other words, a century may not be enough to actually uh, get rid of the differences we see today for groups that are so far apart. Thank you very much, George.